Let's go to Hebrews chapter 2. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 2. After telling us about God folding up the universe like a garment, and uh, the administration of angels there in chapter 1, let's read verses 1 through 4. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect, if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders, and with diverse miracles, and gifts of the Holy Ghost, according to his own will. Notice the use of the term we uh, throughout this section. The we would have to be Hebrews if we're to believe the title of the book. Verse 1, therefore we ought to give uh, the more earnest heed, uh, which we have heard, uh, lest uh, we should let them slip. Someone is in danger here of letting something slip away, which causes them to neglect salvation, as we read in verse 3. This has nothing to do with the New Testament the church age salvation of the believer. It's not Paul's doctrinal revelation to the Gentiles at all, as found throughout the book of Romans, for example. You'll find the Gentiles guilty before God, Romans chapter 1. The Jews also guilty before God, Romans chapter 2. The entire world guilty before God, Romans chapter 3. And the example of Abraham's faith, described in chapter Romans 4, how that Christ's righteousness was imputed to the sinner by faith in Romans 4. Uh, you'll read about the believer's justification now by faith there in Romans 5. The believer is said to be dead to sin now, Romans chapter 6. And the saints are now married to Christ as the collective body of believers, they constitute the bride of Jesus Christ, Romans 7. Uh, the saints live after the Holy Spirit and his leading, Romans chapter 8. And we have God's righteousness and mercy only through Jesus Christ, Romans chapters 9 and 10. And so the idea that a, a Christian is in danger of losing something or letting something slip away either from his grasp so that he ends up losing his salvation is contrary to what Paul wrote to all the other church churches throughout the New Testament. Verse 2, it says, For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, he's just told you back in chapter 1, verse 13, that the angels were not as powerful as the sun, but they were still powerful, and therefore the word spoken by them was steadfast. Turn back, if you will, to Acts chapter 7. Acts chapter 7. And let's begin there at verse 30. Acts 7, beginning at verse 30. It says, And when forty years were expired, there appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai an angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and as he drew near to behold it, the voice of the Lord came unto him, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled, and durst not behold. So, <clears throat> later we're told that the law was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator, Galatians 3, verse 19. Moses was the mediator, and the law was ordained through the ministration uh, of angels. And it was an angel that was said to be sent through the wilderness, leading the children of Israel on their journeyings. Exodus 32, verse 34 states, Therefore now go, lead the people unto the place of which I have spoken to thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee, and so forth and so on. The Son is superior 
two angels, but in the Old Testament, an angel of the Lord was a theophany, or was sometimes called a Christophany. It was an early preview, an early appearance of Jesus Christ uh, in the form of a man uh, to someone in the Old Testament, in the form of a, um, more than likely, uh, in the form of a young man, about 33 years old, and uh, without any wings on his back. Do you realize that in the scriptures, no angels are described as having wings on their backs? Not a single verse in the Bible. And yet in medieval and Roman Catholic artwork in the Middle Ages, they did wrong with wings on their backs. And um, Dr. Ruckman would point this out and he'd say, you know, if you didn't put wings on them, people would wonder, what's that? So they say wings, oh yeah, that's an angel. And yet no angels in the Bible are described with wings on their backs. And um, there are no female angels described in the Bible. There are no little chubby cherubs with diapers or anything like that in the scriptures either. They're all described as young men. Um, but uh, also, verse 2 says, And every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward. It was an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in the Old Testament. Uh, in fact, let's go to Exodus 21. Exodus 21. Yeah, we'll start there at verse 23. <clears throat> Actually, start at verse 22. And if men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, strike for strike. And verse 22 is one that needs to be <clears throat> expounded on just a little bit. If men strive and hurt a woman with child so that her fruit depart from her, and that's commonly understood to be a, an expectant mother, a pregnant woman, and men get into a fight and some woman gets in the way and somehow she's said to lose her baby, uh, miscarry, and that but that can't be, because the next phrase says, and yet no mischief follow. Well, I don't know what would be more mischievous than a pregnant woman suddenly losing her unborn baby because two men got in a fight and caused it to happen. So it has to be more than that. Um, the, the book of, um, I think the book of Proverbs uh, describes the fruit of the womb as his reward. That is a child that's already born. You know, I think it's Solomon that says, Blessed is the man that hath his quiver full of them, children. So this is undoubtedly a child that's already born, and more than likely, his mother is holding that baby, nursing that baby, and uh, her fruit depart, and it's the, someone breaks that up. It's in the way of that mother nursing that baby, and not yet no mischief follow. So that's more than likely the right way of understanding it, because... If a child were to suddenly be stillborn and die because of that, that would certainly be mischief following. So <clears throat> then he says in verse 22, He shall be surely punished according as the woman's husband will lay upon him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, here's the definition of mischief, then thou shalt give life for life. So mischief meant someone dying because of it. And so, it, so the original, the first verse can't be uh, an unborn child suddenly being miscarried or, or, or lost prematurely and, um, and dying because two men got in a, in a fight. It has to be some woman nursing a baby and someone breaks that up and cause that to uh, uh, interrupt her feeding that child. And so the mischief had some reference to someone losing their life, or in this case the baby losing its life because of it. But um, it was eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Um, that's equitable punishment. 
As I mentioned in our church hour, nothing less than the life of the murderer is sufficient payment for the life of the victim, which he took before that. So there's uh, nothing cruel or unnatural about that, eye for eye, foot for foot, and so forth. You know, certain natural laws are in place all the time, no matter what someone believes or what somebody professes. If you're a fornicator, if you're some pervert sodomite, and uh, there may be a natural recompense, that's the result of your actions, according to Romans chapter 1, and verse 27. For example, it might be VD, herpes, syphilis, HIV, AIDS, or any number of communicable diseases along those lines. If a man is a two-pack-a-day smoker, he has no one but himself to blame if he develops emphysema or throat cancer or mouth cancer or lung cancer or anything like that. He has himself, only himself to blame. And the, the amazing thing is you've got decades and decades now of absolute scientific research and proof that smoking is detrimental to your health and can lead to all of those diseases, and people still think, well, it won't happen to me. You're an idiot. Same thing if you're a, an alcoholic or a heavy drinker, thinking, well, you know, cirrhosis of the liver or some weakness of the liver, that won't happen to me. Don't be so sure. All those people before you didn't think it would happen to them either. So there are certain laws in place, regardless of your faith, your profession, or anything else in the, in the world. Those are consequences for sin that don't require some court of law to get involved and make a, a determination. It's the law of reaping what you sow. Galatians 6, verse 7 says, Be not deceived, <clears throat> God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Verse 8 says, He that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, and he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. So <clears throat> that's the consequence of reaping what you sow. That's the, that's the case whether you're living under the Old Testament of the Law of Moses or living in the New Testament under the Law of Christ, the Law of Grace. And um, <clears throat> if you jump off the Golden Gate Bridge or the Empire State Building, the laws of force and gravity uh, aren't suspended just because you're a Christian. They're activated. And you're going to suffer the consequences of it. They're going to pass judgment on you. They are in force no matter who you are or who you think you are. They pay you back according to what you have coming to you because of your own actions. Now, it says, verse 3, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Again, the we will have to refer to unsaved Hebrews. That's the context of this passage. And the writer, if it's Paul, we believe that it is, associating himself with them, Although the verse is used spiritually by New Testament believers uh, as an admonition to get saved now and not to discount the gospel, as so many do, it's not good doctrine for a Christian since he can never lose his salvation. I'm thankful for that. Amen. I'm so grateful that God did the saving. All I could do was the trusting. I couldn't, as a six-year-old boy, I was able to discern and understand that I was guilty of sin, but knowing all the intricacies, all the details of spiritual doctrine, right doctrine, and rightly dividing the word of truth, and all of those things we hold dear, I wouldn't have been able to tell you anything about that, but I knew I was guilty as a sinner, and God did the saving. All I was able to do was the trusting, and believing that he wanted to save me, and was willing to save me if I would uh, confess my guilt to him. And I was able to do that. You know, if, if all you are is um, worried about going to hell, that's plenty of good motive for getting saved. Or <laughs> you just don't want to go to hell. That's enough good motive. That's a good enough reason to say yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. And God will save you on that basis alone. Whether you understand uh, the scriptures uh, before you die someday or not. And so... I'm grateful that God doesn't require me to somehow either earn it or then live up to a certain standard in order to keep it. He doesn't require that. He does the saving 
he asked me to do the trusting. To believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, Acts 16.31 said to the Philippian jailer. And then Paul and Silas said, and thy house. If they believe, they'll get saved too. And you don't have to fully understand all the scriptures at all. You have to understand you're a sinner and be willing to admit that and believe that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed uh, as payment for your sin. Do I understand how physical blood from the Savior, somehow the, the power to cover the guilt of my sin and the sins of everyone who's ever called upon Christ, to cleanse them and grant to them eternal life, uh, that which could never be taken away from them? Do I fully understand how that could happen? Absolutely not. And yet that's the scripture, and that's the word of God, and, and so um, I have to believe it because the Bible says so. And um, verse 3 says, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, implying Christ's earthly ministry in the flesh to Israel. Matthew 10, verse 6, Jesus told his apostles, but go ye unto the, uh, the, uh, house of the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And... Um, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. What Christ said was confirmed later by his apostles. And the references to the twelve apostles. Go, if you will, back to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. And notice there are verses 15 through 19. Galatians 1, beginning at verse 15. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter, and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. I jump down to chapter 2, verse 9. And when James, Cephas, or Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen, and they unto the circumcision. By the way, the word heathen, uh, primarily refers to white people in the Bible. That's a very humbling thing for a guy like me to admit to, and yet it's true. Um, the heathen and the word Gentiles are used interchangeably in a couple of places in the scriptures. And uh, it was, it was uh, Noah's son, Japheth, that went westward from... Uh, the separating of the, the three sons, and became the father of uh, the, the, the Gentile nations, the Isles of the Gentiles. Think of the Greek Isles, the British Isles, and so forth. And uh, so it ought to be a very uh, humbling thing for any white person to think somehow we're superior. Not. If God had one superior race, it wouldn't be white people. It wouldn't be black people. It wouldn't be... Asiatics, Korean, Chinese, as such, it would be the Jew. If God's ever had one race upon whom he's granted his favor, it was the, that sliver within the Shemites from Abraham and all of his descendants. And among the descendants of Abraham, you'll find dark skin, light skin, yellow skin, short, tall, fat, skinny, you'll find it all. That if because of intermarriage over the centuries, but a Jew uh, is a Jew, and uh, those are the ones that God favored more than anybody else. Those are the ones he said were his people throughout the Old Testament. Um, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and turn from their wicked ways and seek my face, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. And that wasn't spoken to any New Testament Christian. We make a spiritual application or the Christian who ought to trust in God, ought to depend upon God for leading and direction, 
but more, but literally, it was said about the Jew. Those were God's people in the Old Testament. And so uh, that's just a little side note that the word Gentile primarily referred to, uh, or that word heathen rather, primarily referred to the Gentile. I talked about the heathen in our church. I always think of heathen as, you know, people running around with no clothes on and, and just using a bow and arrow and a spear. And, well, white people were like that at one time. Everybody's ancestors were probably like that at one time in some part of the world. And um, not everybody's got the good sense to cover themselves up like they ought to, especially white people who are prone to sunburn. I have no idea why they do that. What is it about white people that like cold climates? For some reason, white people, they love to live up in Arctic Circle and north parts of Canada and Alaska, where there's just nothing but cold, icy tundra all year long. Why? I have no desire whatsoever. I might go there and visit, perhaps, yeah, but only if someone else paid my way. Otherwise, I'm not interested in spending my money to, to you know, go to northern Alaska or to somewhere like Why? I'm not interested in it. But, um, and yet, generally speaking, white people like to gravitate toward, towards cold climates. Don't ask me why. I guess they figure if we have enough uh, coats and coverings on ourselves, keep ourselves warm, that'll, that'll compensate for the cold weather. <laughs> That's why everybody that lives in upstate New York and Michigan and Ohio, they want to move out to California, right? Um, those folks have good sense, but the ones that love that part of the country live in Buffalo where it's, you know, you got snow, it's five feet deep uh, every year. Why? Why in the world would you want to live in conditions like that? If I'm living somewhere, I want to be at least to see the ground that I'm walking on. I don't want to have it covered up with four feet of snow most of the year. But some white people like it such as that. Anyway, Paul could possibly say Christ's ministry was confirmed to him after speaking with Peter and James and John, but he later insisted that his real knowledge of Christ came from divine revelation. And I should have had you look at Galatians chapter 1, if you're still there. Galatians 1, for example, look at verses 11 and 12. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. It was God who was revealing himself to the Apostle Paul uh, com completely apart from anything Peter or John or James could have instructed him about or taught him about. Verse 4 says, God also bearing them witness, the Apostles, both with signs and wonders. And the references to the Jewish signs given by Christ to his Apostles. We read about that in Mark chapter 16, verses 17 and 18. These signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. In my name they shall take up serpents. And um, drink, if they drink any deadly poison, it shall not hurt them, and so forth. And uh, that was for the Jews to persuade them to believe. And Paul says in Romans 1, verse 22, For the Jews require a sign, but the Greeks seek after wisdom. Uh, white folks, particularly after those after the leftover from the Greek Empire, the, the government of the world saturated with Greek influence, they call that uh, the Hellenization, H-E-L-L-E-N-I-Z-A-T-I-O-N, Hellenization of, of the world, and it refers to the influence the Greek Empire had on education and philosophy and politics and every other, uh, and art, every other interest in, in the world. But uh, after that, now the Jews were under the Roman Empire, but it had been greatly influenced by the Greeks before them. And the Greeks seemed to have wanted to be able to intellectually understand something completely before they would assent to believe in it, before they would agree to believe in it and follow it. But the Jews could be persuaded by some divine miracle which could not have been done by the, the sleight of hand or craftiness of, of man or some clever magician. In fact, 
<clears throat> Run back, if you will, to the book of Exodus. And Exodus chapter 4, if I'm not mistaken. Exodus chapter 4. Recall that God had given Moses two signs to perform uh, for the Jews, to convince them that God had indeed appeared to him and spoken to him, and that what he said was on behalf of God. And that was, put your hand in your bosom, pull it out again, and suddenly it was white with leprosy. Put it back in, pull it out, it's made perfectly whole, that quickly. And the other was to cast his rod on the ground, and it would suddenly become a serpent. Pick it up by the tail, and it became a rod once again in his hand. Those two signs were miraculous, and they were intended to persuade the Jew that God had indeed spoken to this man. We, should, we better uh, heed what he says, listen to him. But look what it says in Exodus chapter 4, and near the end of the chapter, Verse 29, And Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the children of Israel. And Aaron spake all the words which the Lord had spoken unto Moses, and did the signs in the sight of the people. Notice the next phrase. And the people <clears throat> believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the children of Israel, and that he had looked upon their affliction, then they bowed their heads and worshipped. So the signs were intended to get the Jews' attention and cause him to believe what was about to be said by the prophet. So, <clears throat> uh, the Jews required a sign. The Greeks sought after wisdom. Verse 4 also continues in our text. And with diverse miracles, uh, God revealed himself to Israel. Go back, if you will, to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. And let's begin there with verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple, who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked in alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something from them, of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked, and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. That was certainly miraculous. Look at Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter 5 and verses 15 and 16. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. Then came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. The miracles, the healing, was intended to get the Jews' attention, that God had indeed spoken to these men, and that they ought to hearken, and listen to what Peter and John and James and all the other apostles were about to preach to them, or what they were saying to them. And it says in our text also, and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. And the reference will be to apostolic gifts, including these signs. Uh, the book of Isaiah said, with men of other lips and other tongues will I speak unto this people. So the speaking uh, with other tongues was also predicted to be manifested to the Jews, which it began to be on the day of Pentecost and after that. But uh, in apostolic gifts, including uh, signs uh, intended for Israel. Look back at a couple of places. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12. 
or I can read it if you're not quick on the draw, 2 Corinthians 12, and verse 12 states, Truly the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. And 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 22 Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. So the signs were intended to cause the Jew to believe, and tongues were said to be a sign. So therefore, you have to conclude, tongue, the gift of speaking with other tongues, was a sign to convince an unbelieving Jew that God had spoken or he had revealed himself to this person who was speaking with the other tongues to get that Jew's attention and lead him to Christ. It's a funny thing, the Pentecostal brethren, and I say brethren because I, I believe many of them, probably the good majority of them, are truly saved. They, they trust Christ the way that you and I trust Christ to save us. Amen. It's just that by definition they're always very shallow in the scriptures. I hate to say that, but it, it's been my observation and my experience that that's true. They're very shallow in their Bible studies. Nevertheless, I call them brethren. They believe that uh, speaking in tongues was some sign that New Testament Christians were supposed to uh, follow and engage in and expect God to, to grant to them. But when a Pentecostal missionary leaves to go to another country, You know what they have to do? Study the foreign language. God doesn't give them the miraculous ability to speak uh, French or Arabic if those are the countries to which they're going. They have to study those languages. And so, so truthfully, they don't even believe in it by the fact that they have to study the languages if they want to go to another nation and preach Christ to them. So, uh, it's one of those things that it looks great, it, it seems exciting, and people, wow, I wish I could do that. And the truth is, nothing's happening. Nothing's happening. No one's getting slain in the spirit, miraculously healed. Um, they may be knocked down by some power, but it sure isn't the Holy Spirit. I'll say that much. And finally, um, all of this is... Um, foreign to Paul's letters to the Gentile Christians throughout the rest of the New Testament. In those he claims that he is not a whit behind the very chiefest apostle, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 5, and um, that Peter, James, and John could add nothing to what he had already learned from the Lord Jesus Christ, which we read a couple of verses there in Galatians 1 verses 11 and 12, uh, and, and Galatians 2 verse 6 that God was now bearing him witness. And uh, you don't need to turn. Let me run to it and read it to you. Acts chapter 19. Acts 19, verses 11 and 12. And God wrought special miracles by the hands of Paul, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the diseases departed from them, and the evil spirits went out from them. God was bearing witness to Paul's preaching by miracles being performed uh, through him, even by some piece of clothing. Someone would rip off his clothes and go touch it to a sick person, and that person would get well. And um, I told you about the, 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 the handkerchiefs and the napkins that I got from Oral Roberts Ministry. I forget who, who gave it to me. I've got two down in my office that have uh, Oral Roberts handprints outlined on them. And I guess the idea was that if you take that napkin and add his handprints traced on them and put it on the, the part of your body that has pain, you know, uh, that the pain would go away. You'd get better. Well, it was nonsense. When I was working for Chick Publications 35 years ago, somebody had sent Jack Chick uh, one of those, it was like one of those <clears throat> cheapy elastic shower caps you get in a hotel, a motel room. And it had some faith healer's hand traced on that. And you're supposed to put that shower cap on and uh, pray and, and ask God for your healing. And uh, it would be the same as that 
TV or radio preacher laying his hands on you, and when you got better, you know, send that thing back in along with your love gift. Uh, it's always the love gift. That's what they really want. But this is a, a circuitous way of, of getting around to that. Anyway, um, so God was bearing witness of Paul's preaching, and not that he was bearing witness of them, as he states earlier uh, in chapter 4, or verse 4. Now, if Paul is the writer, and by the way, that's why, well, let me not get ahead of myself. If Paul is the writer of the book of Hebrews, which I don't think we doubt, he's eliminating himself and his personal experiences from the narrative here as it develops in chapter 4 or chapter 2. He's leaving his audience to the authority of Peter, James, and John, not to his authority. And uh, there's all kinds of tribulation implications for that, because, as I've mentioned before, the epistles of Peter and James and John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John specifically, uh, are part of what we call the general books of the Bible. They have some doctrinal import for someone who will be left behind after the rapture takes place. And since the Apostle Paul uh, didn't consider himself to be a part of that number, uh, their teaching, their revelation from Christ, will be the rule of the day when the rapture takes place and the tribulation begins following that. So we mentioned before all of their epistles um, are aimed doctrinally at those left behind after the rapture. And I think we mentioned in the very first week that we started the book of Hebrews, Paul may have written this book about uh, not letting things slip, not neglecting so great salvation, and a, a number of other points along those lines before God began to reveal more of himself to Paul. It may have been the first thing Paul ever wrote, but uh, wasn't completed, wasn't published, or sent abroad until Paul had greater revelation and began adding to it. Uh, and that seems fairly plausible. In the tribulation, all Hebrews must prepare for the world to come. Look at the very next verse, which we'll get to next week. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, wherever we speak. You mentioned in the next verse, and any one of them can neglect salvation during that time. So, um, I'm going to stop right there, but the, the verse, um, how shall we escape then if we if we neglect so great salvation. It's been used by Christians for a long time to admonish someone to believe now. Don't reject the gospel. Don't discount it and say, it doesn't apply to me or I have no interest in it. One day you'll be extremely interested in it, but don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until it's too late for you to respond to the gospel and God save you. Get saved now while the getting is good and uh, trust God to to do the rest. Write your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. Impute His righteousness to you. Feel the send you with the send the Holy Spirit to live inside of you and to baptize you into the body of Jesus Christ and become part of the bride of Jesus Christ. And um, not only are you and I said to be in His hands, but we are said to be part of His hands. We are His. We are members of His body, of His flesh, and of His bones. So you're not in His hands hoping I don't jump out of his hands or he drops me or I lose my salvation. You are said to be part of his hands. You're part of the body of Jesus Christ. So you're not going to lose your salvation any more than Christ is going to cut off his own right hand. So never worry about that. Worry about failing him with the opportunities that God gives to you between now and the day you go to heaven. Those are the things you need to worry about. You can lose rewards. You can lose fellowship. You can lose all kinds of blessings because of disobedience and neglect of uh, chances and to serve Him, live for Him, that God sends along the way. But you can't lose your salvation. And it's a marvelous thing to think. Think of a Christian. He's been born again. Somewhere along the way, he was regenerated by the Holy Spirit when he trusted Christ to save him. His name's written in heaven. But he never does anything for Jesus Christ. He never musters the courage to go offer a gospel tract to somebody 
to answer someone's question or try to talk to them about the Lord Jesus and why why he loves Christ and what he believes Christ has done for him and why God wants to do the same thing for that sinner. He never does any of those things. He's not very much, he's not a good reader or student of the Bible. He doesn't pray like he should. Maybe he doesn't attend church and go with other Christians where he ought to go. He doesn't do all of those things that we think are really part of living for Christ. And yet that same guy is one day going to bear the immortal and incorruptible image of Jesus Christ all the same. It's hard to wrap your mind around God doing something that wonderful for somebody who does very little for him. And yet by trusting Jesus Christ, that is the destiny of every sinner who is forgiven by his grace.